welcome to the Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today we're returning to Quo and some amazing channelings. In particular, the idea of seeking out the invisible. Also, a conversation with Latwi and Hatan, who are a part of Quo, who discuss their location and their origin, and we get some interesting information. I found it very fascinating. We begin on a channeling that was given on May 20th, 2007. The question today for Quo is from G. It is, though I go about every day as if I'm seeking the creator, I am seeking something that is entirely a concept in my mind. Something for which I have no reference. Something which I have never consciously seen nor ever truly experienced as an incarnate being. How does one seek that which is so invisible? and completely unknown to the conscious self. Carla Channeling begins by saying, We are those of the principle known to you as Quo. Greetings in the love and the light of the one infinite creator in whose service we come to you this day. We thank this circle of seeking for inviting us to join their search for truth. It is our privilege and our pleasure to share our humble thoughts with you. As always, my friends, we would ask that each of you take full responsibility for choosing out of those things that we have to say, the material you wish to consider. By that we mean that if our thoughts do not seem resonant to you, we would ask you to leave them behind. If you will guard the gates of your own perception in this way, we will feel much more free to share our thoughts without being concerned that you might take our thoughts to be those of an authority and not those of entities who, like you, walk the circle of seeking through infinity back to the source whence all of us came, the one infinite creator. My brother, in asking about how to find the creator when the creator has no part in intellectual discussion, you pierce through the thin veneer of civilization and culture to the heart of spiritual seeking. The one known as R was speaking earlier of skating across the pond of life, staying on the surface of things, and perhaps avoiding the discomfort of the depths of insight. Even on the surface of life, even in the most limited of awareness, there lies the one infinite creator. Yet we will readily agree that in order to begin to penetrate the surface layers of illusion that surround the mystery of the one infinite creator, it is well to think in terms of moving deeper into that mystery which lies within you. When you say there is no objective referent, the one infinite creator we understand your thought we believe or indeed the creator is not an entity that can be invited to parties or dressed in a paper hat he cannot blow a whistle on new year's eve to celebrate the passage of time the infinite creator is intelligent infinity that which by definition cannot be thought there is no conception in the human mind that can compass infinity and eternity The human mind is designed to work in space and in time, moving linearly in space and time, step by step, along the path of seeking. Yet there is much more than your mind to the third density, incarnate human being that you are. Indeed, you have two minds. You have the mind with which your body was born and the mind which is consciousness. This is a key point when working with the idea of seeking the Creator because one needs both minds. One does not need to discard the intellect, but rather to understand its place and to understand that each of you as seekers is not your intellect, but rather is the charioteer that decides where the seeds of your intellect shall go and how fast you shall take the road. The intellect is a helpful resource for the spiritual seeker. It has those powers to analyze and synthesize and make new combinations and patterns. This investigative and analytical capacity is very helpful in developing your arsenal of discernment and wideness of thought. With the intellect, you can read as widely as you wish until you are familiar with what a number of other people have said about spiritual seeking. This constitutes a ready and helpful source of inspiration, and we would not denigrate or shortchange the value of your intellectual mind. We only ask that you realize that you need to be in the driver's seat. You often need to hold your intellect under your very tight rein, for it will tend to plunge around corners of new thoughts and directly into the ditch, 
fueled by old mind, old memory, and old assumptions. The intellect is resistant to change. When one becomes a spiritual seeker, one has chosen to accelerate the pace of change and transformation within the life experience. So although the intellect can move the spiritual seeker into a situation of becoming more aware of who he is and why he is here, it is generally not the intellect or the capacities of the intellect that are able to keep the seeker in balance and on track as the tides and waves of change and transformation sweep over the seeker who is opening like a flower. Consciousness is the other mind which you have as a mind-body-spirit complex, as the one known as Ra calls a person on this earth. Unlike the mind which is particularly and solely your own, you share the faculty of consciousness with all beings. We are not simply saying that you share consciousness with all other human beings. We are saying that you share consciousness with every iota within the infinite creation of the one creator. This is the second key. The nature of consciousness is not particular to you. Rather, because of your innate nature as a part of the Godhead principle, your heart beats with the pulse of the one infinite creator. That which created all there is, is a certain vibration of consciousness that, for lack of a better term, we have called unconditional love or logos. That one, great original thought or logos, has created the starry heavens, the vast spaces within each molecule of your body, and you, a unique point of intersection that catches two worlds, that of the everyday waking consciousness of your people skating across the pond of life, and that of the one infinite creator whose thought is a thought of unconditional love. There is indeed no objective referent to the infinite creator in terms of your science. There is no way to prove the existence of a ground of being. Certainly scientists and church fathers alike declare the obviousness of the creator's existence. Scientists move from an observation of the way nature works and find, if they are open, to deeper contemplation of the vast intelligent design of the creation that there is indeed an author of such meticulous clockwork, such brilliant precision, and such unimaginable and far-flung creativity. Those of the church, whatever the type of church, tend to feel that there is no need to prove that the creator exists because it is obvious that something made all that there is and something stands behind those creations that he has made. That something is defined over and over and over again through countless millennia, thousands of approaches to religion, and hundreds of basic approaches that various religions and sects share. But the fundamental tenet of those who focus on religion as a way to learn the ways of the infinite creator is faith. In religion, it is by faith that the keys are turned in the locks of wisdom and the doors swing open to offer realizations and insight. All of these words only wrap at the door of the deeper truth, which is that the objective referent of the one infinite creator is yourself. What do you know about yourself? You know your desires and the strength of your desires. You know that one thing has led to another in your life in a path that has seemed anything but straight. And yet as you gaze back over your life experience, you see how everything fell as it did in order to bring you to this present, immaculate moment of now. What would you say if we asked you who you are? What is the I of you? This is the third key. One ancient name of the Creator is the Hebrew I Am. It is variously interpreted as I am that I am, or I am becoming what I am, or simply I am I am. And so each of you is an I am. Naturally, you have been taught to ignore such ways of thinking. You have been taught precisely who you are. You have been told that who you are depends on your age, your sex, your station in life, your accomplishments, the roots of heredity which brought you into this life, and so forth. You are endlessly defined by those who do not know you. Even your parents who would know you more than anyone else perhaps tend to fail to grasp the heart of who you are because they are so close to the outer aspects of who you are. 
as they raise you and help you to move out into the world as they understand it. And yet the whole time, you are also existing in a very profound space of I Am. And this space is held in common with all things. Yet in the flesh that you have taken on for this incarnation, you are able to embody that mystery and that paradox that is the one infinite creator. We ask that you practice, perhaps, daily for a while, an exercise that the one known as Ra has given through this instrument before. We ask that you look into the mirror at yourself, gaze into your eyes, not seeing the color and luminosity of your eyes or the face around those eyes, but gazing into the blackness at the heart of the eye, which is letting the light into the internal workings of your physical body. It is through that aperture that your soul shines out. Perhaps you have known people whose gaze instantly made you glad and happy because of the quality of love in their gaze. The Creator shines forth from your eyes when you allow all of the tensions and the worries of the day to fade away so that you become empty of all the detritus of human life. Empty your pockets, my friends. Take out the concerns, no matter how cogent and intelligent those concerns are. For now, for the purpose of seeking the heart of the Creator, let the concerns of this day fade away and open your mind to that level of things where that thing which is important today shall still be important 10,000 years from now. This takes you immediately to consciousness. You might call consciousness the mind of the heart, for indeed, within the human energy body, the seat of consciousness and the intelligence and insight of consciousness is the inner heart. A great deal can conspire to keep you from knowing, feeling, and living within your own sacred heart. Therefore, the seeker may need to restructure his day in such a way as to make time for that reckoning with the deeper self that brings an entity living on the surface of things down into the regions of truth, beauty, virtue, and all of those values that are worthy 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years in the future, and in this very moment as well. It is not that you must cut things out of your life in order to do spiritual seeking. It is rather that you invite that which is not your intellect, but that which is consciousness to take its proper place as the other resource that is pulling the chariot of your seeking. You do not have to depend on your intellect alone, nor do you have to abandon your intellect and depend upon faith and consciousness alone. Rather, the two are yoked together just as your spirit is yoked to your body for the duration of this incarnation. There is a purpose for your being here now. Indeed, you have created the lifetime which you are enjoying in terms of choosing the relationships that shall be important to you within this incarnation, choosing the cluster of gifts and skills that you have brought with you to share with the world on the outer or manifested level within this incarnation. And you have chosen those blindnesses seeming faults and ways of being uncomfortable that shall offer you catalyst so that in this valley of the shadow of death that your short life is you may make straight in that desert a highway for the creator each time that you encounter a tangled pattern that calls out to you to be solved remember that it is grist for the mill this discomfort and suffering is valuable for in the fiery furnace of this suffering this very situation that seems so difficult shall shake you and break you open so that the gems hidden within the ore of your personality may be harvested and you may suddenly, for the first time, see a jewel-like and utterly beautiful aspect of your consciousness that you never knew was there. It was only through this catalytic action, this shaking and stirring of the self, that you are able to see more clearly the choices that lie before you. When you seek the one infinite creator, we ask you to remember that you have entered the precincts of mystery and paradox. All things are one, yet every single being is different. Even every snowflake is different. That is the kind of paradox that lets you know that you are on the track of the one infinite creator. Do not be satisfied with easy answers and the seamless arrangements of thoughts that go into religious, spiritual, and philosophical edifices of thoughts. For these are edifices of the mind and the intellect. 
they shall not bring you to the infinite one. They shall only make you very good at moving symbols around in your mind so that you feel that you have thought upon the divine. Instead, we ask you, if you wish to know the one infinite creator, to invite that creator into your life this moment, ask and you shall receive. Can you bear the brightness of the face of the one infinite creator? We believe you can, and in that faceless face that exists and does not exist, in that place of mystery and paradox, shall you find a pleasant land indeed opening before you, a land in which you feel that creatorship within you. Another suggestion we might make to the seeker who is working on this deep question is to move from an assumption that is chosen irrespective of its obvious truth. As the one known as G said, he acts as if he were seeking the infinite one. We would ask him to take a step further. We would ask him to act as if he were the creator. He has created everything in his creation. You all have created everything that there is in your creation. You have named every feeling, every object, and every point of view as you choose. Experiment then, my brother, with acting as though your thoughts had the power of creatorship. This is not a great stretch, for indeed this is true. You are the creator of your universe, and your thoughts have the power to adhere to life as you know it. Therefore we ask you, what shall you create this day with your thoughts? What kind of creation have you created? What environment for spirit have you provided for yourself? When you speak, are you aware that that which you judge is judged and found wanting and that which you approve is acceptable? We ask you to move from this point of exquisite accountability at the end of each day as you assess your thoughts. See what you think you have created this day in terms of a world in which to live. Move and have your being. Have you created an affectionate, compassionate, sweet world in which your soul may bloom? Or have you brought down the blight of intolerance, prejudice, and the acceptance of injustice and lack of love? Have you been at war this day within yourself or with another? What are your thoughts this day? For you are the creator, and that which you create within yourself is outpictured into the world. As we understand the creator, my brother, there is no entity or image which is the object of your seeking. Rather, as all things are vibration and constantly in motion, you seek the totality of vibration and motion. And as you become accustomed to this acceptance of the illusion of that which is solid and the reality of that which vibrates and moves endlessly as does light, you become truly aware for the first time of the unified and integrated nature of all that there is. And you can at last see that the object of your search lies deep within you, not only deep within some part of your body or your mind or your spirit, but deep within every cell of your body, within every cell and iota of your mind, and within every speck of that shuttle which is consciousness in motion, the spirit of the living creator. This livingness of the creator is that livingness of you and all of those around you, all creators, all mirrors of the sacred for you, that you may see the Creator in everyone, in every bush and tree, in all of the elements, in all of nature, and most of all, within yourself. We are those of Quo and would ask if there is a follow-up to this query. I have a question, Quo. Could you comment on the similarity between a religion called in our culture Christian Scientology and the concepts in the Law of One? Because one of the readers asked if there are similarities and if Scientology is picking up on the same principles that Ra described in speaking of the One. We are those of Quo and are aware of your query, my brother. We would compare then three ways of thought, the Confederation way of thought, the Christian science way of thought, and Scientology's way of thought, the structure of that which is called Christian science or the Church of Christ. Scientist has a very harmonious connection to the Law of One in that it sees clearly that all things are illusory except for faith, will, and the unity of of all that there is. Certainly there is much baggage that comes with any world religion, yet there are aspects of that way of thought that are profoundly united with the basic concept of the Law of One, which is the unity of all things and the transparency of all things to the will of each individual who holds the Godhead principle within his consciousness. 
The system of Scientology has not the core principles in common with the law of one, but rather various ways of dealing with the world around one, especially in the attempt to lift oneself away from the heavy energy of unforgiven situations and thoughts in the past during the incarnative period. That is, Scientology and the Confederation philosophy alike suggest that it is possible to release pain and to alleviate suffering by digging through the ore of the human personality until those nuggets of pain that have created patterns of suffering in the incarnation are unearthed. When those nuggets of ore are seen in the light of day, and by that we mean the light of insight, forgiveness, and understanding, it may be seen that the suffering is not necessary, that it is a trouble bubble, and it needs only to be popped, released, and forgotten. This kind of clarity is helpful to the spiritual seeker, and it is this basic tendency and vector of thought which is most congruent with the Law of One philosophy. May we answer your query in any further way, my brother? I will extrapolate because I'm not familiar with Scientology myself, but you have mentioned that the core principles in the Law of One are not the same for Scientology. Are those core principles the principles of free will, of intelligent infinity, and love light? We are those of Quo and my brother. We would add to these quality of unity and say that this is a completely correct answer. Question. Quo, can you confirm the accuracy of the following conclusions? In about 6,000 to 4,500 BCE, an agrarian societal population lived in unwalled towns of respectable size, appeared to have a female deity focused on crops and husbandry, had no weapons of war, and was matriarchal due to women's ability to give birth. We are those of Quo, and my brother, we would agree not on the date, but on the fact that there have been several agrarian cultures that flourished for a time, beginning with what your people call Lemuria and moving into Europe as well as South America and Africa. The most recent of those cultures has remnants of thoughts that are still active within your culture, and that is the society of Celtic beings who were matriarchal in nature and who saw the principle of Godhead as being feminine. Indeed, you will find in old churches in and in parts of the British Isles to this day, especially Ireland, the symbol of the yoni, or the vagina and the open legs over the church doors, combining the energy of Christianity with the energy of seemingly pagan celebrations of fertility. And we would note that it is this feminine principle that is so often missing and so hungered for in your culture at this time. Rather than embracing the power of the feminine principle that can nurture and create life in her womb, and bring it forth in affection and joy. The proponents of the one God and chosen people religions, which include Christianity, the Jewish religion, and Islam, among others, have tended to demean and denigrate women, denying them not only their spirituality, but their worth as human beings. They have consigned them to be second-class citizens. We might note that in our humble opinion, there is a tremendous amount of fear behind that urge of the male to suppress and control the feminine principle. Indeed, the opposite needs to occur in terms of your globe's being able to spin itself out of the endless cycles of war and aggression that the unbridled sway of male energy has created within your Earth world. Moving to a channeling given on September 21st, 1986, Carla begins to channel Hatan, who will just give speeches without questions, beginning with, I am Hatan, and I greet you in the love and the light of our infinite creator. It is a great privilege to speak with you this evening, and we thank you for calling us to your group this evening, that we may share our thoughts with you for whatever value they may have to you. Our native home is the density which you now strive, the density of love, compassion, or understanding. It is a density when lies are no longer necessary, and masks may be tossed away. For our thoughts are all shared, and we accept and harmonize each other's characteristics, and seek together to be of service. Each of you has many impulses to live in just such a way, and we assure you that it will be your native land too when you have finished learning the lessons that you have set for yourself in this density of yours, the density of conscious awareness. Your density, my friends, must learn that consciousness has a certain characteristic, which is its original characteristic. Consciousness is not a neutral thing, but rather sprang from a creative force, that creative force we call love. When the seeker decides that it is time to take the spiritual journey in hand and attempt to accelerate the rapidity with which it is pursued, the seeker gazes at his own awareness, his own consciousness, after he has asked the question of identity and said, Who am I? and answered himself, I am consciousness. 
the seeker must then turn and ask what is consciousness it is easy for us in hindsight to tell you that the original thought from which has sprung all consciousness and which is the nature of consciousness in whatever distortion you may find it is love all that you see about you manifested in whatever form is made of a direct emanation of love which is called by your peoples the photon or light light in various rotations forms itself into all that you see feel use and call by name all elements and combinations of elements and yet my friends your lessons involve something beyond this simplicity for you are not simple but complex and you have made for yourself an illusion that is not simple but complex you have made this for yourself because you have found it helpful in learning the lessons of awareness and consciousness to pose for yourself the seemingly impossible and insoluble problems in order that you may through meditation and contemplation and analysis discover the love that lies in all its simplicity at the heart of every tangle of illusion the seeker must gaze at all the passes before his eyes with a determination to see that is perceive what he is looking at in the light of creative love and so move from complexity back to simplicity breaking the illusion and entering the density that is to come my friends this all sounds as if we were recommending that you do very grand things perhaps meditate a great deal or do something dramatic to bring mankind together there are those who have planned to do something dramatic within an incarnation but most entities within any density are working for the most part upon themselves and so what you are working with is the little things therefore forget your impressions of spirituality for you will work best upon your spirituality by paying close attention to the very small things of daily life we ask each of you to look at what you have done this day at each word that you have said to another at each gesture and smile and frown that you have shared with another consciousness what intentions had you for service this day service to others service to self and service to the creator how much of today was spent in fulfilling neutral needs without inspecting them for the joy that lies within the humblest task you see my friends the one who irons a shirt praising it as a part of the creation of the father dwells in the kingdom of the original thought of love and that kingdom is within him at the very moment that he wields the humble iron the cook who praises the broth and smiles at the soapy dishes has garnered far more riches than good food and a clean kitchen for the consciousness of joy and peace has come into the domicile and softened the neutrality of everyday things what little angers have you had today that pulled you away from consciousness into unconscious negativity how much of this day did you lose how much of this day did you fail to function because of confusion anxiety worry irritation or distraction my friends we realize that the questions that we ask cannot well be answered by any entity for concentration fails the best of intentions do not endure and one must periodically start again yet we assure you that there is no penalty metaphysically speaking for the wasted moments indeed each mistake teaches each misstep strengthens future steps and when you must rest then at the end of the rest you simply put your foot on the path again that path to the consciousness of love does not go anywhere it is always with you your perception of it may shift and change but it is as near to you as your breath you have only to calm the mind and feel the key turn within the door that opens your heart to that path for you see my friends the path of spirituality is a path which is taken by the heart as well as by the mind and for the most part it is a difficulty in feeling universal love that distracts the attention from the path we do suggest that you attempt to spend some minutes of your time each day in meditation no matter what else you may do during the day the silent meditation is the most efficient tool for seeding within you the awareness of the love of the creator when you dwell within that consciousness you are no longer working under your power a power which fails much like batteries fail and which must be replaced by your sleeping periods no meditation is much like finding the electrical cord for constant power it may flow through you then and not from you and you will be far more radiant and able to dwell in the consciousness of the love 
and the light of the one infinite creator. When you have focused for enough days and weeks and months and on the little things, you will look back and you will observe that the large things, even the great things, have taken care of themselves. For when you develop the discipline of faithfulness, the scale of that to which you are faithful does not matter, and you will find the large things as easy as the small and as free from worry. We encourage each of you in your several journeys and would be very happy to spend meditative time with you at your mental request if you so desire. We find this instrument is unusually fatigued this evening and so we shall cut this message short. Reluctantly but with thanks that we are able to use this instrument, we are those of Hatan. We leave you in all that there is in the love and light of the infinite creator. Adonai, my friends. Jim is channeling, then says, I am Latui, and I greet you, my friends, in the love and in the light of the one creator. We are also most honored to be asked to join your group this evening. It is our privilege to attempt to answer those queries which you may find value in asking. As our brothers and sisters of Hatan, we would remind each of you that what we have to share is our experience and our opinions and we would not wish to put ourselves forth as any source of infallible information. Therefore, take that which we give which is valuable to you and leave that which has none. With that caveat, we may begin. Question, are Latwi and Hatan located in the same place, same planet? And if so, what is the relationship of the position of such planet in relationship to our solar system? I am Latwi, and am aware of your query, my brother. Those of the vibration known to you as Hatan are of a planetary consciousness, much as your own planet would appear if each being upon it shared the mind of each other, and thus had a great resource upon which to draw in seeking the light and sharing the light with others. Their vibration, shall we say, is that known to you as the vibration of love, the universal love and compassion that sees the creation as one thing, the one creator in many parts. We, of the vibration known to you as Latwi, are also of a planetary mind quality, yet we have in our journeying moved into the next vibratory density of light, that known as wisdom. Thus we seek at another level of vibration from either those of Hatan or those of your own planetary influence. We as well as those of Hatan are not located within your own solar system as you call it, but find ourselves some distance and experience removed and seeking the one creator in a system which is difficult to describe, yet which moves with its own rhythms of being. Question, how long has Latwi observed the events of our earth that we call our history or antiquity? I am Latwi, and we have been consciously and carefully observing the conditions upon your planetary sphere for a period of what you would call time that would measure as approximately 25,000 of your years, we have information that is somewhat older, shall we say, concerning your planetary influence and its progression in evolution that has been left to us in thought patterns or records, which we have also perused in order to further intensify our understanding of your particular position as a population and as a planet within the evolutionary process. Question, can you tell me when the third density experience first began on planet Earth and where? I am Latwi, and we find that the third density experience, that experience which is now reaching its culmination upon your planetary influence, found its origination some 75,000 of your years in your past. However, there are many of your population now inhabiting your planetary influence which experienced previous third density experiences upon other planetary influences in other solar systems as you call them and thus have within their memory banks or resources recall of third density experience that far exceeds that of the 75,000 year period that is the normal length of time necessary in order for the self-consciousness awareness to develop to the point that the possibility of experiencing universal love and compassion is available. The point or place of the origination of the third density experience upon this planetary sphere is not one point or place. We are attempting to show this instrument the mental image of your planetary influence and to describe those places which were among the first to be inhabited by the third density population that was first upon your planetary influence. We show this instrument locations which are no longer in original configuration for there have been land masses upon your planetary surface that have, as you would say, 
been swallowed beneath the seas in previous times. One of these is known to you as that of Lemuria, or the landmass of Mu. Within this area, many of the first of your planet's population found their beginnings. We further attempt to give this instrument the picture of an area within your African continent, that area in the northeastern portion of that continent, and further surrounding the body of water that you now call the Mediterranean Sea. Within this area, many of the first of the population of your planet found their beginnings. Also, we show this instrument a location in South Central Asia, as it is now known, which was also a place of the origination of another of the first of your third density population. There were other beginnings that were at a somewhat later point in your planet's cycle that are located within the South American continent and within the continent known to you as Australia. Question. Did those of the population of Earth of the third density plan and construct the Great Pyramid of Giza, or was there some influence from other entities? I am Latwi, and we find that both of your suppositions are correct for circling your entire planetary sphere is a pattern of the pyramidal structures that had as their origin sources exterior to your planetary influence, for at various portions of your planet's cycle of evolution, there have been times when the planet itself was in need of balancing or alignment, and the cultures of your planet at that time, in some few locations, were of a level of advancement, shall we say, and openness to information from sources outside of their culture, that it was possible for entities of other planetary influences to communicate certain information, and to take part in the construction of certain of the pyramidal structures that would allow not only a balancing of your planet itself, but of individualized entities who would enter these structures for the purpose of healing and initiation. In many cases, the pyramidal structure at a later date then was copied and constructed by portions of your planet's population. Thus, the source of the pyramid form is twofold, that of your planet and that exterior to your planet. Question, what did the process involve, the balancing that you mentioned? The pyramidal shapes performed some balancing for the Earth or within the Earth? Can you describe that further, please? I am Latwi, and we shall attempt to give a general description of that which is somewhat complex in its nature. Each portion of the creation, and each planet in particular, is formed of and by that force which you may call love. Each entity of the third density level of vibration which walks your planet, and the planet itself, receives a constant infusion of this intelligent energy which we have called love, and this infusion of love moves into the entity which it be one in such as yourself or the planetary entity, through the vortices of entrance, shall we say. These lines of force that surround an entity or a planet, and which may be seen as analogous to an aura, move and cross in various patterns. Certain intersections of these lines of force permit an influx of the energy of intelligent infinity, which we have called love. This love then invigorates, ennobles, and enables the entity, be it an individual or a planet, to continue upon the evolutionary process. When there has been a period of what you call disharmony amongst various portions of a planet's population, and this period of disharmony, even unto the bellicose actions of war, has lasted a significant length of what you call time, then this heat of anger radiates into the planetary surface itself and seeks release in various ways. As the release is sought, the spin, shall we say, of the planet itself, as it moves in its orbit, about that body that you call the sun becomes somewhat unstable. This instability makes the influx of intelligent energy or love somewhat more erratic than is optimal for the steady progression along the evolutionary path of the planet itself and of its population. Thus the pyramid structures are an aid in rebalancing this imbalance because they have the ability to influence the planet's spin, shall we say, or use of the intelligent energy of love. Thus, this type of balancing pyramid may serve not only the planet, but may serve individualized portions of a planetary population which have also found certain imbalances within the mind-body-spirit complex. Question. It sounds like we are during another period in which the Earth is heating up. Would the construction of more pyramids help balance the Earth once again? Or is that possible? I am Latoui, and am aware of your query, my brother. At this time, as you would call it, the population of your planet has by the phenomenon of the continued process of evolution found itself in a collective position where each entity with the conscious awareness of the evolutionary process may serve as what you may see as a portable pyramid. 
that is to say, the conscious intentions of those who would seek to heal the ruptures in this planet's electromagnetic field due to constant disharmony for a great portion of your planet's experience may take part in this balancing or healing of the planetary entity as a result of conscious choice and practice. Thus, such an entity, and there are many, many now upon the planetary surface, may within the meditative state see those energies balanced. We find that we have apparently exhausted the queries at this session of working. We thank each of you for taking the time and the space in incredibly busy lives to seek the truth. And we thank you for asking us to be a part of that search and that seeking. Certainly you teach us every time that we come to your circle. We thank you for that which you have taught us, and we humbly hope that we may have offered you some thoughts that may prove fruitful in your own process of seeking the truth which is ever and always the same. All is one. You are all that there is, including the one infinite creator. You can fold your tents, you can fold up your life, but you cannot fold up the power and the peace that you carry in your consciousness and in your life. You can stretch your life out to the heavens and to hell, and yet you cannot compass the power and the peace of the one creator that lies within you. We wish you good journey. The trip to the center is a trip of great beauty, and upon that trip you are never alone. For entities such as we wait to be asked to partner with you and lend you our affection and our support. Ask and we shall be there, not with words, but with our love, and with that information that goes too deep for words. We are those of the principle to you, known as Quo. We leave you in the love and in the light, the peace and the power of the one infinite creator. Adonai. Adonai. Adonai.